Well, here I am back in Munich, Germany. This is not the first time I've been to Munich. In fact, I remember as a young boy, uh, my parents brought me uh, here uh, to Germany. And, um, you know, I've always been fascinated uh, with the German culture. Uh, and then as I grew up, I, I came here uh, as a professional tennis player as I was on the uh, uh, the tennis circuit, but uh, I retired at the age of 29, moving from that back into my love, which was biology, and particularly microbiology. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, study here in Germany uh, with a great scientist and doctor, uh, Marie Be uh, uh, Blucker, and uh, she was uh, my first experience in understanding and grasping hold of uh, some very interesting thoughts. Uh, not, not conventional uh, in that uh, the Pasteurian theory where uh, everything is, is static or constant, but more from uh, the work of Gunther Enderlin. Uh, you see uh, Dr. Becker was uh, a protege of Dr. Gunther Enderlin. And uh, so her influence, uh, as well as Dr. Gunther Enderlin, uh, had great uh, impact on my life and also uh, my research, particularly in the areas of biological transformation. Uh, this was uh, my first exposure to this, and uh, it was Dr. Blecker and the work of Dr. Enderlin that introdu introduced me to a doctrine called pleomorphism. And uh, pleomorphism is a word that means many formism. Pleo meaning many or morphism form. And they were speaking and teaching uh, this uh, etiology that germs could transform themselves in different environments or pHs. And so this was an environmental uh, perspective on looking at the germs both outside and inside the body, particularly inside the body, because we were evaluating the, uh, the blood plasma, uh, the germs had the capacity of taking on different forms based upon the internal milieu or pH of the internal fluids of the body. Uh, Dr. Enderlin spoke uh, uh, in his work, in his writings, that uh, there were several uh, Stages. In fact, he introduced uh, a word called the endobiont, uh, uh, or the beyond uh, could take on different forms and had various stages uh, or life cycles. Uh, one being a bacterial stage, another one being a, a fungal stage, and a culmin culminate stage, which uh, uh, was found in the mold, uh, particularly uh, two which. Uh, was Aspergillus niger and muco or, uh, muco or, uh, or microorganism uh, that uh, was also a mold. Uh, and, uh, and it was interesting, their byproduct or waste product was citric acid. And I've often reflected on that particular thought uh, when they were talking about the byproduct of their metabolism was a byproduct of an acid, which many of us take on a regular basis, called vitamin C. And that was my first uh, introduction to uh, many of the waste products. And there's over a thousand different compounds. Uh, citric acid was just one of those uh, waste products. One that's characteristic to Aspergillus niger uh, is the lactic acid. Uh, and so we find lactic acid very common in uh, degenerative diseases, particularly cancer. Lactic acid is present. And also what Enderlin and Dr. Blecker would suggest is that mold is always involved in cancer. Now they looked at that as, as, as a primary infection, when, as, as if it was the mold that was causing the cancer. Later, I diverted from that particular etiology uh, as I did more of my research uh, and, and kept questioning, you know, is it the mold? Is it the bacteria? Is it the yeast that's causing these 
health challenges? Or are these just manifestations of cellular transformation and a symptom of cellular breakdown based upon a change in the internal environment? So the internal environment became then very, very important. Um, I finally came to the conclusion that there were two basic theories of my work or two hypotheses of the underlining theory. And, you know, I think this is really difficult for most people to accept. And, and granted, uh, you know, I, I, I can understand that because it seems so simple and so easy, but maybe that's the beauty of it, that it is simple. Uh, that disease has the same origin. That regardless of what the name we give it, uh, the disease at different levels of acidity have the same origin. Uh, and there's many different classifications of these different states of compromise that then gives rise to this transformation that we're seeing in the blood and when we're either manipulating the internal milieu, you know, taking away oxygen, introducing a more acidic environment, or some physical disturbance, which then gives rise to these various stages of cellular transformation. So I today look at bacteria, I look at yeast, I look at mold <clears throat> as not the primary cause of sickness and disease. I look at it as a symptom of cellular transformation due to a compromise in the environment from various things, what we eat, what we drink, and even what, our, what we think. Even our thoughts uh, can produce acidic waste products that can compromise the internal environment. So this uh, somewhat, you know, diverted from my teachings that have German, you know, beginnings. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, honor that and, and respect it very much because if it hadn't been for Enderlin's work, if it hadn't been for Marie Blecker's work, you know, then maybe some of the thoughts that uh, have come to me in viewing what I've viewed now close to 40 years, watching and looking at blood, setting up different standards in order to create certain outcomes based upon a change in that internal environment. So you can create bacteria, you can create yeast, you can create mold by manipulating the environment. Uh, and so this is, uh, with this particular uh, thought and perspective on the origin of all sickness and disease, I then started uh, thinking about, well, there must be then stages of acidity. And so I staged everything. In fact, I came up with seven stages. The first stage of acidity where the internal environment becomes compromised due to what we eat, what we drink and what we think is loss of energy. It's enervation. When we start losing energy, or we don't have enough energy, or we're sick, or we feel tired, this is the beginning stages of a compromise of the internal environment. The second stage was sensitivities. The third stage was irritation. Within that irritation, there was a substage of um, a buildup of catarrh or mucus, where the body is in a preservation mode trying to buffer or neutralize a buildup of acidity to protect the organs that or glands that sustain life. Then I went to the fourth stage, which is inflammation. And now what we're finding uh, is a common acceptance, both conventionally and traditionally, that inflammation is a precursor to very serious chronic disease. So inflammation precedes multiple sclerosis. Inflammation precedes diabetes. Inflammation precedes uh, cancer. And this, this is accepted now, at least in the United States and I think worldwide, 
that there's a connection between inflammation and very serious disease, degenerative disease. What is not connected is what causes inflammation. And what I've said many, many times is that you cannot have inflammation without acidity. And with acidity, that gives rise to inflammation. So if you take the acidity away, the inflammation goes away. And if you want to create inflammation, you just have to increase acidity. Uh, so when the body can't remove its own metabolic or dietary waste products, okay, a dietary waste product, uh, let's say from meat, uh, let's say uh, uh, uric acid, if the body can't remove uric acid, uh, if the body can't remove lactic acid. The body has to do something with that. And so as I did more investigation, I realized that in a stage of inflammation, which I refer to as stage four acidosis, that the body is throwing acid that's supposed to be eliminated through urination or perspiration. It's being held within the connective tissue and then being pushed out into the fatty tissues. And that, uh, that particular theory then brought rise to a book I wrote called The PH Miracle for Weight Loss. And the basis of that particular work was that obesity or excess weight was accumulating outside the body as a depository for acidic waste products, both dietary and metabolic, that were not properly being eliminated through defecation, urination, perspiration, or respiration. So it was a protection. And I find it much easier to work with someone that's overweight than underweight. Uh, because uh, dealing with acids in the fatty tissues is a lot easier than dealing with acids in the glands and organs. So uh, particularly if the organs are, are now being broken down by those waste products. So from inflammation then, this idea that inflammation's cause is a result of the body's inability to remove its own waste products, it's tied to acidic waste products, either from eating beef, chicken, pork, or fish, or it's tied to anger and worry or some emotional aspects that's creating more acidity. Uh, from just the meta, uh, metabolic processes of our thinking proce process uh, that acids are produced, um, you know, that the body was trying to protect itself and does protect itself. Uh, I went to the fifth stage of acidosis, which was induration. So what does a body do if it's pushing acid out into the connective and then fatty tissues? But what else does it do? Well, it pulls oxidants or antioxidants, I should say, just the reverse, but antioxidants or alkaline buffers. One of the major alkaline buffers of the human organism is sodium bicarbonate. But I didn't realize we're the primary source of production of sodium bicarbonate. I wasn't certain if it was created in the liver, if it was created in the bones, if it was created uh, in the pancreas, and I finally came to the conclusion, uh, and based on this theory, that the major organ for the production of the most important alkaline buffer that the body produces, which is sodium bicarbonate, is produced in the lining of the stomach. That, that is its major purpose, is not to digest food, but as a contributor of sodium bicarbonate both to the blood and tissues when let's say you're exercising or if you're ingesting food to secrete alkalinity on the food and really answers the question that everybody likes to ask me, Dr. Young, is it okay if I drink with my meals? With the idea of, you know, conventional teaching that if you drink with your meals, even traditionally, that you're going to neutralize the hydrochloric acid of the stomach and if you neutralize the hydrochloric acid of the stomach then you're going to slow down the digestive processes. So I realized that this was a medical myth that this whole idea that the stomach was a digestive organ I have now realized through my work 
that the stomach is not a digestive organ, that the pH of the stomach can, can be measured because it all began in Germany. You know, it's called the Heidelberg Method. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. But the Heidelberg Method is where they originated this whole theory. You eat some food, you test the residues after that, and of course they always come out acid because the only thing that's left is the hydrochloric acid. But why not test before? Why not test during this whole process? And what you find out is if you do the tests before, when you, even if you have a thought of food, that the stomach pH rises, doesn't drop. And the reason it's rising is because the stomach is secreting sodium bicarbonate to prepare that food for biological transformation that takes place in the crypts of the small intestine. And it wasn't until 2011 that my work was actually substantiated or validated that stem cells and the main purpose of the small intestine is not to absorb or break down food, but was to create stem cells in the crypts of the small intestine. And it was the stomach's purpose to prepare that food at a pH of 8.4 so that when it reached the small intestine, that liquid alkaline food could be then transformed in new stem cells, which would become the new blood, and the new blood becomes the new body cells. Um, you know, without blood, you can't create, you can't create body cells. Uh, every body cell is made out of blood. And all of that creation begins in the crypts of the small intestine at a pH of 8.4. And the stomach, the pancreas, the gallbladder, all of these glands secrete, the pylorus glands, secrete sodium bicarbonate. Even your salivary glands, the pH goes up as soon as you put food in your mouth. It doesn't go down to digest it. It goes up to alkalize it. So the answer is very simple. Absolutely, you can drink with your meals. And the best water to drink is alkaline water with uh, very active hydroxyl ions. The reason why is OH minus, which is, carries that extra electron, will bind up the hydrochloric acid, neutralize the hydrochloric acid, so that all of the sodium bicarbonate can be used to raise the pH of the food. This is how you reverse indigestion. This is how you reverse all stomach problems, uh, is you start drinking before, during, and after your meals, and not just any water, because the water has to be purified, it has to be alkalized, it has to be functionally structured in a way that can permeate the cells. Um, and when we do that, uh, when we're drinking water that's purified, that carries a high pH, uh, I like it about 9.5 or greater. Uh, I find that 9.5, you know, generally across the board, regardless of the person, uh, where they live or what culture they are, 9.5 is a very common, easy water. Uh, and people benefit from that because when we can reduce the hydrochloric acid, which is a very caustic acid, has a pH of about 1 to 1.5, uh, can be very, very harmful, particularly which the blood can't handle if it's absorbed back into the bloodstream. So it's interesting, I'm talking about the stomach right now because, you know, you can go on Google, you know, you can go back to your medical text and, and, and uh, you can, what is the pathology to nausea? I don't know if you've ever looked at that. There is no, it's idiopathic. Did you know there's no science on the cause of nausea. Something as simple as that. The, probably, if not the number one, at least the number two ailment that affects everybody across the board who eats food is getting nauseated. But nobody understands what causes it. I always say, well, too much acid in the stomach. Well, if you're creating a molecule of hydrochloric acid, you're creating a molecule of sodium bicarbonate. You can't create hydrochloric acid without creating a molecule of sodium bicarbonate. The science is very simple. 
I mean, it takes salt, water, and carbon dioxide. And something, a fact that very few people know is that 90% of all carbon dioxide is used by the, the stomach to produce sodium bicarbonate. 10% is actually exhaled. So a major part of the component of producing an alkaline comp is actually a waste product of met, uh, metabolism, which is, carbonic, uh, which is carbon dioxide. So the body uses that to produce that sodium bicarbonate. The pathology is very, very simple. When women, when they're pregnant, you know, they end up with morning sickness. There's no pathology for that. It's idiopathic. You can't find it. But with this new science, what I call the new biology, we now know what causes morning sickness. We now know what causes nausea. Something so basic and simple. Uh, you know, one of the major elements that people take, uh, let's see, what is it called? Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> Probably heard about it, yeah? I don't know what they call it over here in Germany, but what's the same thing, right? <laughs> but, I mean, what's the major ingredient in it? Calcium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate. You know, they add the citric acid in there, which I'm a little puzzled about why they would do that. Uh, you know, maybe a little sugar to taste, taste good, but... Uh, bottom line, uh, the reason it works is because even at a pH, and we've measured Alka-Seltzer, even Alka-Seltzer gold has a pH of about 5 to 5.5, but when you're dealing with a pH of 1, you know, we're still dealing exponentially with something that's thousands of times more concentrated in, in electrons than something uh, like hydrochloric acid that's uh, just saturated with hydrogen ions. So taking Alka-Seltzer, believe it or not, there's doctors in America that use Alka-Seltzer to treat cancer. Can you believe that? They don't know why, they just know it works. Well, we know why it works. Because the stomach is the major organ that protects us from just about all the craziness that we do out there. You know, like drinking alcohol and drinking coffee and drinking beer and that, oh, I shouldn't say that in Germany, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, that's probably not good, but especially in October, right? <laughs> All right. Well, I think there's something different probably, and I haven't studied it, but there's something different about German beer than American beer. Would you agree? I'm, I'm sure there's something, something about that. Yeah, so, you know, maybe, maybe that's another study. Uh, not a self-study, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe look at that a little bit closer. Um, you know, one thing, just uh, since we're talking about alcohol, and it's really not my discovery, it's, it's Dr. Glenn Magalco's uh, research, because part of what we do is non-invasive medical diagnostics. And I'm getting off this seven steps, but I'm going to come back to it. So don't let me, I, I've only got to number five, right? In duration? Okay, in duration, just if I didn't explain it to you, in duration is the body's attempt to solidify a liquid acid to protect the body, organs, and glands. That's why we create stones. Did you know that, that calcification or stones, it's idiopathic? You don't learn in medical school what causes stones. You just know that stones are created and they're not good. It's not taught. But when you understand the new biology, when you understand that the body is attempting to protect itself through induration, then you look at plaque on the walls of the arteries totally different. You say, well, that plaque is there as a protection. You look at thrombosis, totally different. The body is actually clotting within itself in order to protect itself from internal bleeding. Do you understand? You see, these are all mechanisms that are built in that we think are diseases, but in reality are protections from the way we're living, the, you know, our lifestyle and dietary choices that are affecting us. So, you know, sclerotic plaque, even cholesterol. I mean, we look at the Framington study that's been going on now for four or five decades, and they're finding that high cholesterol is, a, you have a lower risk for coronary heart disease than normal cholesterol. And the reason why is because cholesterol is not bad, Acid is bad, and cholesterol increases in order to solidify that acid to protect the body. 
So by lowering cholesterol with statin drugs, we're now finding the side effects. And we're now publishing those side effects. By lowering cholesterol, we're actually harming the body. What we need to worry about, but if we understood, but what we need to focus on, not worry, but focus on is what is the underlying cause and effect. And that's really been the nature of my, my work, is cause and effect relationship. I call it the pH miracle. Somebody said, well, what does the pH miracle mean? The pH miracle is a natural phenomenon between the cause and effect relationship that's currently not understood by science. And I'm trying to explain it. But what happens is because it's such a shift in the way we think that people go, whoa, you know, is this guy crazy? Well, I've been crazy now for quite a few decades. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, but I'll tell you what, my results speak for themselves. So getting back to, uh, to alcohol, what we have found is that, uh, that alcohol, particularly wine, you know, we, we end up with uh, some serious liver problems. And we, we, we see that uh, uh, in, in, in a lot of our patients that are drinking wine. Uh, more so, I would say, you know, than maybe some other beverages let's say like beer, but wine becomes, a, becomes a, a serious problem, particularly for the liver. Uh, of course, we already know that alcohol not only affects the liver, that the majority of pancreatic cancer is caused by alcohol too. And so, you know, pancreatic and liver cancers are a result from drinking wine, more so than let's say drinking beer. I'm not saying you can't get liver cancer, from drink, uh, from dr not drinking beer, but or drinking beer, but you know that's, yeah, it's, it seems to be more common with red wine. Uh, so back to the induration. Solidification is the body's way perfectly to protect itself against improper lifestyle and dietary choices, acidic lifestyle and dietary choices. Uh, stage six is ulceration. And the final stage of acidosis uh, is uh, degeneration. So these are the seven stages of what I refer to as the one sickness, one disease. And the one sickness and one disease is the overacidification of the blood and tissues due to an inverted way of living, eating, and thinking. I truly believe, based on now doing this for close to four decades, that 95% of all sickness and disease is caused by what we eat, what we drink, and what we think. The 5% is genetic, but as we look at genetics, genetics uh, expression is controlled also by what we eat, what we drink, and what we think. So now we're looking at 100% of sickness and disease within our control, within our control. Going back then to stage four acidosis, inflammation, um, we're talking about nausea, we know the pathway to that. Morning sickness, we know the pathway to that now. Uh, uh, the stomach is involved in all of these actions. When you have nausea, that is the body producing sodium bicarbonate to maintain the delicate pH of the blood and tissues. Uh, when uh, uh, we have a pregnancy, acids, acids increase. And as acids increase, that requires the stomach to kick in to produce more sodium bicarbonate. As the stomach produces more sodium bicarbonate, the stomach get, becomes full of hydrochloric acid. And this is why you need to throw that out. This is all a good thing. Uh, it's not a bad thing, but the, the blood has to be uh, maintained at that delicate pH balance of 7.365. So because of that narrow range in the blood, all acids that are not eliminated through urination or defecation or perspiration or respiration go to the connective tissue and then to the fatty tissue. And this is why, and I don't know if anyone else is doing this in the world, I'm sure there are some people, scientists, uh, 
but I know we're doing it. We are measuring the 18 to 21 liters of the interstitial fluids. We're measuring them as it relates to their pH, their pH values. And the reason why is because we want to find out if our patients are in metabolic alkalosis or metabolic acidosis. And really metabolic alkalosis is just the body's attempt to overcompensate for a lifestyle and diet, diet that's too acidic. Where metabolic acidosis is the body that has used up its reserves of alkalinity and now is in a serious uh, chronic condition. Uh, so there's probably a diagnosis there already. Uh, as far as uh, uh, this non-invasive uh, medical diagnostics, uh, rather than using CAT scans or MRIs, we're using uh, uh, thermography, non-invasive thermography for determining inflammation. I think it's the best and only tool, at least that I know of, that will show us in the human body where the inflammation is manifesting itself. Uh, and in using uh, an infrared camera, we're able to pick up those inflamed areas. And that once we see those inflamed areas, we go from uh, non-invasive thermography, we go to non-invasive ultrasound. And the reason why we do the ultrasound is because we can then look anatomically of what's going on with the gland or the organ. We can see if it's in a healthy state. So now we know physiologically what's going on, we know anatomically what's going on, but have we really determined its functionality? And so we're doing a third test, which is also non-invasive, it's called a 3D bioelectro scan. And there what I'm, we're doing is we're evaluating the functionality of all the organs and glands. So anatomically you may have a healthy liver, but functionally it may not be functioning properly. So we can test, test that too. So um, uh, I love the 3D functionality test because not only are we testing all of the body systems, we're also testing it bioelectrically too. So we're, we're picking up what is called face angle. A face angle is, is the electrical conductivity of the body, you know, and, and that's really important because it relates also to the sodium level which creates a matrix of, of which electrons can then be transported on. And when we're looking at the bioelectricity and also the chemistry of the interstitial fluids, it's, it's quite amazing. You may have the, the conventional blood plasma chemistry done and you may have perfect numbers, but, but you're not feeling right, something's wrong. When we look at the interstitial fluids, we're actually looking at what's going on because that's the show that's really the internal milieu, because the blood's always trying to maintain its, its uh, chemical balance, its electrical balance, at the expense of pushing everything out or pulling things in from the bones or the muscles in order to, in order to uh, maintain its integrity. So those are three. On top of that, uh, a couple of other tests uh, uh, that I learned uh, uh, from uh, Enderlin through Dr. Marie Blecker. Uh, who are my German professors uh, that influenced my life, uh, and that's dark field microscopy. Uh, from dark field microscopy, uh, learning uh, and studying phase contrast microscopy, and then going into what is called the Boland test. And the Boland test was, uh, uh, was talked about and published uh, many years ago uh, in the American uh, 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 Cancer Research Association, uh, one of their periodicals. Uh, but what it looks at is it looks at the coagulation of blood. And in looking at how blood coagulates, it forms specific patterns that gives us specific information of the health and well-being of every organ and gland in the body. So we take one drop of blood and based on how it clots, it, it, uh, we can look at the blood and it forms a hologram of which then represents, much like iridology, uh, there's an imprint there. We c I can see uh, various uh, uh, imperfections uh, and various stages, uh, whether it's inflammatory or whether it's degenerative. So that's a great combination 
uh, with basic chemistries that we do now, not just for blood plasma, but for the interstitial tissues. I don't think any of that's being done here in Germany. Uh, the testing of the interstitial fluid chemistries, I'm not sure if they even know how to do it. Uh, but this is something that uh, uh, we're making available now around the world. Uh, we have a clinic uh, in uh, Arlette, uh, Italy, uh, the PH Miracle Tai Sana. Uh, we had just two weeks there, and in the two weeks we had close to 23, uh, we had 23 patients that we saw various conditions from diabetes to obesity to cancer to uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, and the interesting thing is that, uh, well, it may be interesting to you, it's not a surprise to me, that everyone received a benefit. Everyone got a result. Everyone improved in the quality of their health. And some were dramatic and uh, some were just basic steps in the right direction. But when you, when, when you understand the cause and effect relationship, you understand these seven stages of acidosis, you understand how food affects the internal pH, you understand how liquids, how emotions, uh, it becomes very, very basic as it relates to, okay, setting up a treatment protocol. And when I'm setting up a treatment protocol, I have four objectives. That's it. It's very, very simple. My first objective in treating any disease of which we are very successful when we have a patient that's motivated to do what we ask them to do because we don't cure anything. The patient cures themselves. And so I like to refer to my work as a self-care to a self-cure for cancer, for diabetes, even type 1 diabetes. Doesn't matter the diet, even type three. I don't know if you knew there were three types. Uh, three types of, of diabetes. Type three is Alzheimer's, which is also associated with an increase of blood sugars and, or the inability for the pancreas and the stomach to keep up with its alkalinity. Um, so, um, as, I, as, as we're going through these four basic uh, objectives of which the client patient commits to, the first one is, is very, very important. It's to open up the channels of elimination. And there's four basic channels of elimination. The first channel is uh, urination. The second channel is defecation. The third channel is perspiration and the fourth, fourth channel is respiration. And the way that we go about opening these channels using not just basic colonics, but using alkalizing colonics. I introduced uh, two decades ago. You know, people have this, this notion that colonics is something that you do to remove things. Absolutely not. We use it to infuse liters upon liters of fluids that are taken up by the hemorrhoidal veins to literally push the alkalinity rather than using an IV in an arm, which is very invasive. A non-invasive protocol to infuse 9.5, 10.5 alkaline water, chlorophyll, sodium bicarbonates into the blood, which automatically get pushed out into the interstitial fluids. Because I know the blood cannot hold a pH over 7.4. It'll always push it out to the interstitial fluids. But that's where disease begins. Disease begins in the interstitial fluids, not in the blood. So we use colonics to infuse alkalinity. So we're drinking alkalinity. We're infusing alkalinity rectally. And then we put people in salt baths so they can infuse or absorb that alkalinity through the pores of the skin. Then we add exercise. Oh, what a novel thought. I mean, exercise. And I really believe if you don't take time for it, then you've got to make time to die because exercise is very, very critical. And the reason why is because it, it, it forces circulation. And when you force circulation, you force elimination. You sweat, don't you? And if you're not sweating, then you've got a problem. You've got a blocked elimination organ, which is the largest. It's called the skin. Um, so this is what we do. 
That's my first objective. Now there's other things I could tell you about that, but that's, that's just the basics. Uh, the second thing we do is we begin healing the gut. Now when we have the knowledge that the core, the core, our core health, where blood is made in the small intestine, it's only made in the bone marrow and the liver if you're starving to death or if your, your bowels are destroyed. The body goes into what is called reverse transformation. Reverse transformation is when uh, the body takes your own flesh and makes blood out of it. Because if you're not making it out of your food, you'll make it out of your bones and your muscles. And this is why people lose weight when they stop eating. If they go on a fast, you go on to reverse transformation. Because the body's going to make about three to five million stem cells every second. And if there's no food in there, guess what happens? You force the body into reverse transformation. And that means the body's going to take your muscle, it's going to take your, it, it starts with the adipose tissue first, because membranes have to be made of fat. Uh, but it starts that process, and that's why, you know, cancer patients and AIDS patients and MS patients or chronic disease, you all see people, what, shrinking? That's because their gut is destroyed. They have no gut core health. Core health is where, where it all begins. So when we understand the stem cells are made in the crypts of the small intestine, these, this is what gives rise then to birth to the erythroblast and then to the erythrocyte. All of that new blood is then taken from the small intestine to the heart and then to the lungs and then back to the heart to general circulation. This is how we build new body cells. So my focus is healing the core while our third objective is building new and healthy blood. Now I'm checking the blood using live and dry blood cell analysis, not as a diagnostic tool, but as a tool to see how your lifestyle and diet is affecting your general health. So I can look at one drop of blood and tell you exactly what you're eating and drinking. I can see it by the shapes of the cells because I know someone who's eating meat by the shape of the cell. I know someone who's eating dairy products by the shapes of the red blood cells. And so I know basic patterns. This is what I studied for close to three decades, asking people, okay, what are you eating? Oh, okay. And associating foods and lifestyles with the blood and then changing the lifestyle and then watching the blood change. And that's, all of the 23 that were there for those two weeks saw transformations at the cellular level. They saw their blood when they first came in and then they saw their blood two weeks later and go, they, they go, wow, that's different. And not only are they seeing it at the cellular level, but they're experiencing it on a, on a, on a macro level. You know, they're experiencing it physically and emotionally. They're feeling better. And when you start feeling better, you start thinking better. And when you start thinking better, you start doing better. Um, I hope I'm not getting tech too technical for anyone here. But, but what I'm trying to share with you is, is, is the science is really, really simple. It's really simple. And, and, and when we come to the fourth objective, and that's when to, that is to literally force alkalinity out into the connective tissue. Why do I want to do that? Because I know that's where things have broken down. I know that's where we've got metabolic acidosis in a chronic condition. Anybody that's in, in a chronic condition has metabolic acidosis. Anybody that's in acute condition has metabolic alkalosis. I know that. This is not, this is not um, you know, something that we can't prove. And, and, and the nice thing about my science, you can duplicate it. Anybody you know, can, can test it. Uh, so we need more scientists out there. We need more doctors, not just looking at blood, blood plasma chemistries and, and blood counts. We need, we need doctors looking at the interstitial fluids where the real show is happening because you're not getting a true picture when you're just looking at the chemistry when you go to your conventional doctor and they're saying, oh, everything's normal, or your sodium's high or your potassium's low, and it may be just the reverse in the interstitial fluids uh, because the body will do everything to keep you alive in spite of how you decide to live it. 
So I guess if I was to sum this up, uh, and you know, keeping your mind open, and I'm not asking you to think outside the box. I would say that what I'm asking you to do is to make your box a little bit bigger, to include other thinking that maybe will help support and open up ways so that you can help your patients, or if you're not a doctor, you can help yourself. Because I, I truly believe in self-care and in educating and empowering the individual to take care of their own body. Because I've had to do it for myself, and in many cases I've had to empower you know, people that are very, very close to me, like my daughter. You know, as I was teaching my daughter, if I hadn't have been for her teaching, she probably wouldn't be alive today. When she was diagnosed with brain cancer in her third trimester at the age of 21, and when they said, we're taking your baby a few months earlier, and by the way, we're going to do brain surgery. Had she not had the education, the background of her father, you know, she would have been another victim of a treatment. Because there's not too many, uh, there's not too many people that end up with brain cancer that have surgery that don't get it back again or have to have other treatments that eventually die from it. Well, guess what? She's pregnant. This is going to be her fourth pregnancy. I've got three grandchildren from, from my, from my uh, beautiful daughter. Uh, and she's uh, healthy. She's cancer-free. And she didn't do surgery. She didn't do radiation. She didn't ke do chemotherapy. She applied the principles of opening up the channels of elimination, restoring health to the core, building healthy blood, and then saturating the tissues with alkalinity. And, uh, you know, that it, it took a while to where she finally, emotion, on an emotional level, felt like, okay, I no longer have cancer. You know, because the, idiot, the, the idea about all this is there's no cure for cancer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you have a cure for cancer, there's no cure for cancer. Because once you have cancer, you always have cancer, okay? With no, with no science behind those particular statements, you know what? We all have cancer because we all produce waste products called acids that if we don't eliminate them, they give rise to cellular breakdown. When we have cellular transformation, that gives rise to bacteria, yeast, and mold, and it has a domino effect. So if we take one rotten apple and we put it in a bushel of healthy apples, one spoiled cell, one spoiled apple will destroy and rot the entire bushel. It's called the dom I call it the domino effect. So we all have the potential for sickness and disease. And that's why we have four channels of elimination. To get rid of the waste products that if, if, not, if we don't, can make us sick and tired. And, and, and if someone's just new to all this, probably the most important thing that anybody could do is change the water they're drinking. I can't think of anything. If, I mean, even if, you know, you eat beef, you know, I don't, haven't eat, eaten it since 1971. Even if you don't, if you eat chicken, I haven't eaten that since 1970. Um, you know, uh, being an a, a alkalarian, I call it, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not a vegetarian. <laughs> It's not a vegan. An alkalarian is someone who uh, embraces the principles of a plant-based green lifestyle and diet that's free of, let's say, things like high sugar fruits and what have you, or pasta. And that's really hard for Italians to give up, is pasta. For Germans, maybe it's, what, beef and beer? I don't know. Maybe that's, that's what it is. I mean, we all have our nemesis. Uh, uh, in America, it's probably, uh, what, McDonald's? Everything? Yeah. Yeah, it's called the uh, seafood diet. That's the American diet. If they see it, they eat it. <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's, a, that's the, that's the sea, seafood diet. Probably the biggest appoint, uh, disappointment I have is when I come to uh, uh, places like Italy or Germany, and I was in, I was in Venice, and, and I see McDonald's in Venice, I just... I just go, this is, this is crazy, you know, this, this is about money, it has nothing to do with, 
you know, with culture and, and, and you know the and preserving that culture because uh, that's the last thing I want to see is McDonald's or Starbucks in Venice. Don't want to see it. Yeah, I don't want to see the commercialization of it, you know. But anyway, that's just how I feel. I have no control over that, but ho hopefully uh, maybe some of it will rub off on some people. Uh, but anyway, these are just some of the thoughts that I and uh, that I have uh, for you tonight and, and you know, the expression of, of some of my work over the last uh, three and a half uh, decades. Uh, you know, being here at this particular point in my life uh, is, uh, is an amazement to me. I am totally amazed at, at uh, what I've been given and uh, uh, Definitely, it's uh, standing on the shoulders of giants like Anton Bechamp and Dr. Uh, Gunther Enderlin and Marie Blecker uh, and others uh, uh, that have influenced, uh, influenced my life. And so uh, I owe a lot to uh, uh, those of, of uh, German ancestry that have, have influenced me and, and also doctors who have influenced me just on the opposite you know, side two, uh, uh, because the, the original research that was done on uh, blood origin as far as blood is produced in the marrow of the bone is also uh, comes from ger German science. Uh, but I, that has changed. Uh, we now know that uh, stem cells uh, are the primary site for stem cell production is in the crypts of the small intestine, that this is the primary site for blood production, and this is uh, this is done when our food is in a liquid state, uh, when it's in an alkaline state, and of course the best way to keep those fluids alkaline is to uh, chew your food very well and drink a lot of alkaline water that uh, is saturated with electrons, and all of this can be measured. That's the beauty of it. You know, we can prove my words because it can be measured. You know, and we can actually see the transformations that are coming. So rather than just making flippant, uh, let's say, claims, you know, of a, of a type one reversal of diabetes, or a reversal, I just posted just recently of Catherine Livingston, who had six different cancers, uh, from uh, breast cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer. Let's see, lung cancer, liver cancer, bone cancer, lymphatic cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer, brain cancer, I, I mean, it was all through her body, and is in complete remission because of what she was empowered, the gift that she was given. And that gift was the same gift that I was given, and that's the knowledge on how to take care of your body, you know? And guess what? Here's the manual, okay? This is the manual. It's in German. Or it's in English, you know, or it's in Spanish, or it's in Chinese, or it's in 27 different languages. Uh, and these books have found themselves now in, in over 191 countries, and it's had an impact uh, in the millions of people that have embraced this work and are continually embracing it, with small groups and pockets all over the world that are realizing that, you know, the science that was taught at school and at medical school. As a good friend of mine said, you know, I was at graduation and the uh, dean of the medical school stood up and he says, well, I've got some bad news for you and some really bad news for you. So I'm going to tell you the bad news first. The bad news is 50% of all that you've learned here in the last eight years is wrong. The really bad news is we're not sure which 50%. So that's the really bad news. And then you get the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine admitting that over 50% of what they publish is wrong. This is the editor of a major journal. It's, they're publishing things. And a lot of this comes down to the fact, I hate to say it, that there's six major corporations that control all of the journals. I mean, what is this really about, okay? 
So the bottom line is is that uh, you know we have to, we have to look at everything. If it can if if we can measure it, okay, you know, and validate that measurement, and that's what we're doing with thermography, with ultrasound, with 3D functionality, with live and dry blood cell analysis, with chemistries that we're doing both blood plasma and interstitial, okay, bl blood counts. We do it all, and it's all non-invasive, and that's the beauty of it. The unfortunate thing is even because these tests are so important and they give us correct information so we can make correct diagnostics, is it's not covered on, on most major insurance company policies, you know. So when we look at, let's say, uh, uh, a, a mammogram, which is equal to about 100 x-rays versus thermography and ultrasound, I mean, it's totally non-invasive. Uh, we're finding that a lot of these other tools uh, that are being used uh, are, are creating causes within themselves. So, the origin, in summary, the origin of all sickness and disease, I call it the one sickness and one disease, is caused by the overacidification of the blood and tissues due to an inverted way of living, eating, and thinking. It's con consequences of choice. The one health is to restore and manage, or if you don't need to restore, manage the alkaline design of the body. Those were the two things, if I didn't remember to tell you, was the basis of my hypothesis, that the human body in all parts of it is alkaline in its design when we're in perfect health. And the second part of my hypothesis is that all functionality produces acidic waste products, if not properly eliminated, cause all sickness and disease. So if we want to maintain our health and the quality of that and improve the quantity of our life, we have to manage the internal fluids that affect all of the functionalities of all of our body systems. So that's all I'd like to say tonight. Hopefully uh, uh, you've gleaned some new thoughts or information that will help you in your work. Um, and for those who are just learning about my work, hopefully it will inspire you to, to uh, do what I did, ask more questions. And there are answers out there. That's what I've had to do. And I've been blessed to get a lot of answers. And I'm even mutually blessed that not only am I in one of the best professions in the world, and that's the healing profession, but I'm able to help so many people around the world and to empower them and educate them that they can take control of their health and that it's a God-given right to be able to enjoy good health, vitality, and a long and prosperous life.